So once again, we are starting a show with Netflix. Yeah. They're trying to kill us. Yeah. They're trying to take out the movie industry. No kidding. They're not in well, the movie industry. Netflix is not in the know, movie industry, folks. But it's it's interesting. Uh, we're we're going to... Let's let's get into it a little bit here because it's really interesting. You know, they they added how many was it? Seven million. Seven million new subscribers, which is un- unhinged. That's as many subscribers as Hulu has anyway. So, which is what they're trying to do. They're trying to build a brand that becomes uh, essential. Mm. Which is, if you're the person who does not subscribe to Netflix, you're you're the nerd. You're the odd person out. What are you doing? What's Maybe. wrong with you? What's missing? You know, it's the HBO thing, right? HBO did that first and. And really well. Um, if you're at the water cooler and everybody's talking about the Sopranos and you say, oh, I don't have HBO, yeah. then you're not invited to the Christmas party. <laughs> it's a, uh, it, it got me. It, it, yeah. we, we, we talk, a little yeah. friend of mine told me about a series on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, and did all the young uh, going bananas over. Yeah. And, you know, I had let my Netflix subscription, because, you know, I let it go for a minute there. Because yeah. what the hell, dude? With all these things every month, every yeah. month, $8.99, yeah. and, uh, and now I have to reboot it. Now, I will do this. I will boot up any one of those things for a month, yeah, and then kill it. I did yeah. it for Twin Peaks, yep, and then I and, and then I killed it, yeah. Uh, but Netflix, oh man, seven million, dude. You got to admit, it's. I mean, it's. It, what is it now? Eight nine bucks a month. Yeah. Okay, so seven million. So seven times. So that's now an additional fifty six million dollars per month. Mm-hmm. Let's just say basic fifty six. 60 million, let's round it up because it, 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 it's not, not going to make a difference. So that is, that's another $60 million per month. That is 600, that's half a billion dollars per year that you just added. Yeah. Okay, so they do that again. They've just added another billion dollars a year to their, to their, their earnings. And uh, there is not a studio, uh, you know, brick and mortar studio yeah. uh, in this town, anywhere in the world that can do that. Well, no. I mean, it, it, the, the the movie business in its entirety, between all the studios, did what seven billion dollars yeah. last year? Yeah, gross. Yeah. So that means that they are now basically pulling, and none of those stu- it, Disney's the the one that's getting making most of that. Disney's pulling in like at least yeah, half Disney, of that. Disney, Disney, Marvel, yeah, yeah. Pixar, so, Disney, Marvel. Pixar, uh, you know, yeah. Netflix is just they're spending an awful lot to get to that place. Their net is is not there yet. They're still a money losing operation, but. Um, but they're a worldwide money losing well, operation. That's the other thing. I mean, they keep clearing all these territories. Here's here's what I find interesting. Uh, a week ago, we were talking about how they had their li- they're having their little tiff with the Cannes Film Festival. Yeah, and um, they're you know they're not going to have their films in competition because they won't they won't uh, they refuse to adhere to French law on putting movies into theaters because. If you put a movie into a French theater, you're not allowed to actually show it on television or on streaming or anything for like three years. Mm-hmm. And Netflix is screw that. We're not gonna. <laughs> we're, we're not gonna. You know, cut us, cut our own throats. Uh, we'll. We, you know, they're not opposed to putting it into theaters. They're just opposed to that three year right. window, which which was uh, implemented a long time ago. And it's out of date. It is to some degree out of date. Uh, you, you you know, streaming. It doesn't apply to streaming operations. It. it French television will have their Sunday night movie. You know, back in the eighties, I remember being like, "Oh, the Sunday night movie it is Jaws, uh, or whatever it is." And mm. they just wanted they wanted to make sure that something didn't go from theaters to that, right? In in like six months' time or eight months' time, which they wanted, was more or less the same thing. I mean, here, you know, yeah. I mean, if you didn't catch, you know, Superman in nineteen seventy whatever in theaters, yeah, uh, you were not going to see Superman on television for three years. But here's the here's the other interesting thing. Now this week it was announced that Netflix uh, is looking to buy theaters, yeah, possibly even Landmark from Mark Cuban to up their Oscar chances. Now Netflix until now this I find this interesting for two reasons. Uh, first, that literally a week after they said we're not going to play ball releasing movies into theaters, they decide they want to buy, buy theaters. Buy theater ch- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That, that I find interesting. But secondarily, uh, the Netflix has always been sort of, yeah, we don't care about Oscars. Yeah. Yeah, we don't care about awards. Uh, it was Amazon. It's, it's uh, you know, Jeff yeah, Bezos. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah, the yeah, one that wants to win an Man- Oscar. Manchester by the Sea. Yeah, they, 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 and they, they, they want to play the Oscar game. They want to play the awards game. 
And uh, Netflix, you know, here they're writing off the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, well, we're sorry about that. Sorry to our filmmakers, you know, but we don't really care about awards. Uh, ultimately, that's not part of our model. And now they care about theaters and awards. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's going on there in the boardroom, but clearly there are two different um, there are two Lines different mindsets. Of, yeah, uh, at least at least here at, at versus o overseas yeah. for sure. Yeah, and 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 maybe even more places because you know there are all these. You know, all, like I said, they cleared all these territories. Yeah. Um, it, it, and mostly they know that they're not going to lose any filmmakers because filmmakers want to be in bed with Netflix because yeah. Netflix at the end of the day can give you a series. True. And that's where the money actually is. It is. Uh, yeah. uh so, so, you know, uh, some filmmaker, uh, makes a movie, the movie uh, with Netflix, it doesn't play in can. That's okay. Here, here, here are three seasons of that TV show you wanted to do. And, and, and I'm going to make a prediction too. I, uh, the, the thing that I think a lot of people have been afraid of, and I'm one of them. I admit, is that if the Netflix bubble collapses, mm. it's devastating because now it's like a drug, right? Everyone is now relying on it. They've created a new normal of a certain number of series. New, the, 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 there, there's money just flowing to series like nobody's business. There, more people can be showrunners than ever before. Mm. It's re, it's opened up a lot of job opportunities mm. for creatives, tons, and they're committed to, to you know California and Los Angeles too, yeah, which yeah. is a, is great because all these people who are fleeing this state for incentive states can stay home and they can you know yeah. keep paying. Now more. there's not enough stage space. There isn't. Here. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And Netflix has their own little mini studio here, and they're buying Luc Besson studio for God knows why. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> seriously, that's just that makes no sense to me. But still, it, you know, whatever they're throwing cash at everything, and. Um, uh, but if so, if that collapses, wow! Suddenly there is massive unemployment. The money evaporates. There's nothing to fill that fill that space. However, if other companies are stepping up to go after that same audience, mm -hmm. well, now we've got competition, mm -hmm. and everybody keeps saying, you know, what what Disney postponed their big Netflix competitor for a year. They're coming out next year, 2019, right? And I have a theory. I have a theory that the whole Movies Anywhere platform, that Ultraviolet and Disney Anywhere, that when that competition ended and everything became Movies Anywhere, mm -hmm. and now you can, you know, you're, you buy your, your Warner and your Universal and your Fox and your Disney and you put it all into your, uh, your, your, ultra, your, your formerly Ultraviolet Movies Anywhere digital locker and you can watch it anywhere. I have a theory that Disney is going to fold that into their system. So that you will now have a seamless way when the when the Disney Netflix thing launches, mm -hmm. it won't just be I'm going to add these Disney movies to my queue. It will be oh, and here is my Movies Anywhere account linked to it, and mm -hmm. I can add all my Warner Brothers movies that I have in my digital locker, and I can and that all the movies you own on Blu-ray mm -hmm. that came with that code, you're going to be able to fold all of that into this one master monster. Disney ecosystem, which represents not just what they're providing you, but what you also own yourself. I think that's what Disney is aiming for. Mm. And um, uh, buying Fox just makes that even more uh, deadly. The, the, the content, more content. Uh, it's just more content. I which, think of I, course, is the, the gigantic threat, the only threat to Netflix, which is why they uh, keep yeah. trying to get big, is uh, all of these people taking their yeah. content back. Yeah. Uh, and, and emptying them out, which is why they have to create original content, which is why they'll give almost anybody, uh, you know, with uh, yeah. two pieces of string, <laughs> <laughs> go make, you go make yeah. a movie. That's true. Because um, they have to build up that content to serve all of these uh, subscribers. Yeah. Uh, or buy things. Which is true. They And they haven't really bought things, have they? No, no. It, it, so I don't, I don't know what the look, I, ownership, you know, but if you buy it, you own it, you make it, you own yeah. it. Uh, maybe they just don't want to be associated with any other brand other than yeah. the Netflix brand. Yeah. Anyway, I, I do think that they're going to have an effect on theater uh, uh, attendance, ultimately. Yeah. Um, I would love for them to buy those theaters and lower the ticket prices. And, of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the other thing that's sort of lingering out there that's, uh, that's a you know, potential pa a game changer, paradigm shifter, is, uh, is MoviePass. Yeah, yeah. Which, and those are two former Netflix guys. By the way... Ten bucks a month for one entry a day. Per day, yeah. per day. And, by the way, those two ex-Netflix guys who, fo who founded MoviePass... I'll bet you didn't even know mm. that they're two black guys. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah, see? <laughs> see? That, nobody, nobody's even talking about that. Uh, yeah. well, but do you think that will work? 
You know what? Uh, here's the thing that people don't like about Movie Pass is that number one, Movie Pass has been uh, trying to strong arm exhibitors into sharing. Uh, more money than they want to. In other words, saying, okay, you know, we're going to fill a whole lot of seats that weren't filled before, but in exchange for us filling your seats and still paying you full price, you're going to actually throw a little bit of cash our way as well. Mm. So they used to call that payola back in the day. Well, it's it's the mirror, it's the old Miramax thing. If you want this, you got to take gotta this, take or that, you got to yeah, you know, yeah. you know, they're 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 playing, they're they're kind of working the pulleys, uh, which is smart business. Look, yeah. if, if you've you got the well, leverage, you've got do leverage. It. I don't see where the leverage is though. Yeah. Well, the leverage would be if uh, if they had a whole you, lot of subscribers. I'll tell you where that that's that's the, and that's the game. That's what they learned at Netflix, which is you got to you got to go for volume, you got to yeah. go for quantity, and if you have that quantity, then that gives you that gives you like block power. You know, you can you can literally say uh, we have X millions of people, and they've been swelling. You know, subscribers too. They have uh, movie passes, but they added like three or four million new subscriptions in the last month, which nobody really paid a whole lot of attention to. I didn't know, and I'm deeply impressed. Yeah, it's it's very impressive. So they're kind of. I would facing... love to see the 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 the, the demographics on yeah. on movie pass subscribers, how old they are, you know, yeah. female, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I would love to see that yeah. um, because I'm wondering how many young people are doing that. You know, uh, people who are going to want to go see Infinity Wars and all that kind of stuff. More, more and more young people are doing it. Oh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, see, I'm really surprised. I am too. I am too. It's, but again, the, the data mining, the data analysis, the data. all that stuff that Netflix has been so good at, that's helping them sort of engineer their path forward. So uh, I, and MoviePass wants to start making and distributing movies as well. So if they if they do that, yeah, um, you know, and if Movie Pass eventually winds up buying theaters as well, look, in ten years, this entire business will not look anything at all the unrecognizable. same. Unrecognizable. It'll be unrecognizable. Uh, it, it, mostly in terms of where things live, what plays in theaters, what yeah. plays in uh, uh, YouTube Red, yeah. what's on which. Uh, every, I think everything's going to find its corner. I just hope that every corner doesn't have its own price point. Yeah. So that we get back to the thing that we were talking right. about before. Right. Of where, you know, if I want this, I have to. You know, it, 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 I, this, is not, this is on topic, folks. In, in California, we're thinking about doing our own version of net neutrality. Yeah. Because, you know, statewide net neutrality. Um, uh, because of, obviously, you know, all this stuff. Yeah. You, know, it, 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 you, you, you might end up with a situation like that uh, with different lanes. Uh, for for people to sort of travel in, and and you know my feeling on that is that 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 eventually the whole net neutrality argument becomes moot. Mm. Uh, long term, I the, the once all that everything's going to move to the internet, just like phones did. I've I've been on VoIP phone service for a long time. Mm. I gave up the there was no reason to keep paying forty bucks a month per line if I can pay you know like not eight or nine dollars for a VoIP line. Mm -hmm. I'm saving money. So I moved to VoIP a long time ago, and you get discounts for paying in advance. So we basically, you know, we 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 have four lines in our house. Four lines. Mm. We have four lines, and we pay like one hundred and ninety dollars every other year. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and that's and that's great. And then for two years, I don't need to worry about it, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's that's amazing. That's so that 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 kind of model is great, and it's going to move to that too. You're going to, you know, these these companies like, uh, for example, Directv Now, right, mm. is not a satellite service. DirecTV now is is their package through streaming, and they've got a new deal, which is if you sign up for three months of DirecTV now, we're going to give you a free 4K Apple TV box oh, to watch out. it on. Yeah. So they give you the box free, which can record stuff as well. So you you sign up, you're like, I'm down with that. That's like you know eighty dollars or something for three months. For three months, yeah. It's sweet. Here you go. Here, give me my free Apple box, which lets me watch a million other things. And um, eventually, nothing is going to be broadcast. Nothing's going to go through your cable provider, mm. right? Uh, DirecTV will stick in there because of games like that. Mm -hmm. But everybody's going to move to being basically an internet package. You're going to pay somebody to give you an internet package. And local cable companies aren't going to be able to... to you know, justify their Spectrum existence and, because and, 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 because they make their money off of carriage fees. Right. You know, they say, okay, Disney, we're going to put all your ESPN channels on there if you pay us. Or, well, or, or, or sports. Or sports. Yeah. So if Fox Sports and ESPN and all these different packages, that, which are the lucrative ones, if they all move to the internet and say, okay, now we're going to sell our package directly to the consumer who has inter internet access mm -hmm. and we're, we're going to bypass 
the cable provider, well, then then all they are is they're just maintaining lines and, and infrastructure and paying a bundle for all these repairmen who sit on their butts all day long waiting for a call. And it'll be interesting because what you would end up then is is, is with Internet and over the literal over the air yeah. broadcast television, digital yeah. over the air broadcast television, which is so we would be back to 1958. Yes. Basically. All of those companies then, I think, are going to take their 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 business and they're going to go elsewhere. And they're going to become internet providers. And then they're going to take all those all that all that infrastructure that they own and operate as a monopoly in your community, yeah. whether it's Warner Cable or Fiber X, Optics Xfinity lines. or whatever. They're going to take all that infrastructure and they're going to sell it to your community. They're going to give it to your community and they're going to say, you deal with it like a utility. Like a utility, which, then, of course, is what it ought to be. Yeah. It's what but it has become. It's, it's the content versus the infrastructure. That's, yeah. the, that's the thing. People, don't, people who argue for net neutrality say, look, it's all this infrastructure. It's utility. The people who argue against it say, yes, but there's, a, there's the content that's perimeter. The stuff. It's, yeah. a, it's a hybrid thing. Once you separate those two things, which eventually will happen... Then, then the problems no. That I, I know that on, on that day I have no problem. That's okay with me because yeah. I, I can control my content. Uh, you will pay uh, your you will pay your your city city whatever. Entity, yeah, exactly. Whatever. Yeah, you will pay them sixty dollars to maintain the lines. Yeah, and then and but they're not looking to make a profit. They're just looking to you know maintain the infrastructure for you. It's like fixing a pothole. Yeah, just, and, just, and just like just like the uh, the, electrical. the electrical. That's grid. it. Yeah, they're just gonna they're just gonna keep you. They're just gonna keep you well with your service. And then you go online and, and you decide for, what you want. And decide what you want. And uh, who's gonna provide it to you? Like you know, what VoIP company am I going with? Well, yeah. I go with VoIPo. Some people go with uh, you know Vonage, whatever mm. it is. So it, you're gonna have that kind of a thing for content, and it's gonna be fierce competition. And Which should drive prices down, so maybe we can start is. paying uh, what what I, I know we talk about this all the time, but people pay twenty bucks a month for internet service in Europe. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't even want, you you only want to know about the speeds of the internet and the cost of in, in South Korea. Oh, it's insane! It's insane. It's, you know, it's a small country with a lot of cash and a lot, and and it's very easy mm. to, for them to replace the grid, mm. right? I mean, if we have to rewire something, you, you've, we've got a thousand miles of nothing in the middle of this country, uh, you know, prairie and desert yeah. that you gotta you gotta stretch wires across. It's really expensive to redo this country, so we gotta figure something out. Yeah, anyway. it's interesting. Anyway, I agree with you. So, uh, all right, we've rambled enough. Got a couple of a uh, couple of really really good uh, listener mails. Uh, go ahead and email us at gods at digigods.com or gods at cinegods.com. Either of them uh, will get to us. And by the way, g- keep visiting uh, cinegods.com. We're going to get that website uh, spruced up over time and, and more content up there. Um, uh, Paul Driscoll uh, writes to us on uh, some thoughts as to the state of cinema in response to questions that we uh, posed a while back. And uh, I'm going to just kind of sum up a few things that he says here, because this pertains to what we were just talking about. He said, uh, keep in mind, I'm from the UK. So, the, you know, answering the question about failing cinema and uh, my opinion as to why it may be different than the US. He says, first is technology. Uh, I now have a massive TV at home with a great picture. I have a thousand ways, too many choices to watch any film or TV show anytime, instantly, with little to no outlay. Let's also consider and don't uh, the, uh, let's see. Uh, Cody plus a stream app, which is a, a UK thing, gives many people access to literally uh, any movie pretty much for free and instantly compared to 28 years ago, 20 years ago, um, you know, when you had to get VH tapes and Blockbuster and so forth. He, he said, also, going to the movies is expensive. If I go with my wife and adult daughter, you're looking at between all of us and snacks around 50 pounds. And then usually a meal out is tied into going. So before you know it, it can be 100 pounds for an evening entertainment. That to me is the biggest issue. Right is 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 that that the cost of the entire evening going mm. out compared to the cost of staying in with your subscription Netflix, got got to start lowering got got to start lowering prices or, or going with subscription yeah. movie pass yeah. deals. You yeah. got to make it worth it for people. Um, and then watching the film, you no longer have anyone policing the screen. So if someone chats through the movie or looks at their phone, who's going to stop them? Bad behavior. Mm. Now Alamo Drafthouse has that, has that figured out. They scold you and they warn you. Before the movie even starts, they yeah. put the guilt of God right into your soul, and uh, and you don't dare. It's, I think. And it's actually quite bright because uh, what it does is it calls out people before they make the mistake. Yeah. And then if they do make the mistake, and then there is uh, you know retribution for that, you can't, they can't say anything because we yep. told you before you even screwed up. 
And he goes on and says, he says, next, let's flag, uh, the flag for me is that uh, critics are often getting it wrong a lot of the time. Very, very true. So I'm making a big outlay on, on certain movies, and critics say it was amazing, and I think it's bad. Fair enough. Um, and uh, switch critics. There are a lot of us. There are. Uh, he says, now to watch a film, it needs to be spectacle, effect heavy to make it worth seeing uh, on a cinema, it, on a big screen in the cinema. Film like Three Billboards, simply not needed to see on that scale. I get it. Totally get it. That's why Netflix is, is where it is, because they're, there's now a middle ground, and, and those things that they can migrate to your, your big screen at home. Uh, and uh, comic book, and this is what I, this is where I think it was really interesting in his comment. His comments, comic book movies really highlight this. A film based on a book is character and story focused, whereas a comic is visual focused with story as secondary. Mm-hmm. Um, now, yeah, very much. So. You know, here's the thing. Um, are you are you seeing Avengers next week? Yes. Okay. You seeing the morning or the evening? Evening. Evening. Okay. I'm uh, Mark's in town, by the way. I haven't hooked yeah, up with him yet. We're hook up so I'm, I'm taking Mark to the, uh, well, I'm going with Mark to the, I'm picking him up. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go to the morning screening. Um, okay. Now, I counted them up. There are somewhere in the neighborhood between all the Marvel characters in this, now that we've added the Guardians of the Galaxy into this thing, and, uh, you know, all the Black Panther, all the people. Black Panther and all of it, that whole crew, and all these people. I, I, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about, of about 20 Marvel characters who are all going to be like, Figuring out how to take down Thanos. Mm-hmm, all right. Mm-hmm. So if you add Thanos, we're over twenty characters that are central to this story. If you assume that, like most of these things, that fifty percent of it is action, mm-hmm. and that the movie is going to be a whopping two and a half hours long, which I think it's somewhere verging on that. It might be two fifteen, but let's say two and a half for the sake of argument. That basically means it, it, no character is going to get more than hundred and eighty seconds of dialogue in this movie. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to work. I really don't. Can you imagine all of those powerful agents going through that script, counting their, <laughs> counting their clients' lines? Going, no, 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 no. She's, she's going she's gonna to have to say something else. Uh, <laughs> or, I know. just, I don't know. I, I, I have a feeling that, that, that like uh, Hawkeye and, and uh, Black, uh, Black uh, Widow yeah. are going to get shafted, that they're going to sort of show up and go, I'm on it. Yeah. And that's know, it. You know, and they're, ah, with the, with the yeah. arrow. And with they're going to get a lot of action, but, but you're not going to do a lot of talking. Uh, so anyway, uh, Paul goes on to say, okay, so what would bring me back to cinema? Uh, good films, uh, based, uh, on books I love or new topics will get me there. Ready Player One in, uh, in, uh, you know, 4DX will get me there. Outside of that, I recently watched a fun old horror movie called Popcorn, uh, from oh, 1990. Yeah. Uh, if they do a movie night of old films, made it an experience. If they kitted out the cinema, they got the staff to dress up. They made it fun. I would love it if they did a movie club. Put on a classic or a new film, but uh, have a venue where you could chat about the film with like-minded people. Uh, overall, tech, uh, though technology has moved on, and sadly, the Hollywood we grew up with will never be the same. I agree. I mm-hmm. think he's right. Yep. I think he's right. So, uh, all right, let's get on to talking about movies. We're uh, we're deep into the show now, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hit a bunch of uh, documentary stuff on uh, from PBS and some others. Uh, hit this off real quickly. Uh, Bill Nye, science guy, one man's mission to make science matter. Bill Nye has become I like a. I love Bill Nye. <laughs> he's become kind of a political firestorm yeah. for for things that he's said, and you know, and, and global warming, and he shows up on news shows he probably shouldn't show up on. But that said, uh, this is actually not bad. He ha- he is a figure. He's educated a, yeah. ge- a couple of generations of kids with his show. Yes. And um, his new show on on Netflix is a mess. Yeah, it's a disaster. Don't watch it. <laughs> but but where he came from with his original show, Bill Nye the Science Guy, um, is, is that's that's an interesting story. And um, uh, he's now the CEO of uh, the Planetary Society, which is which was originally founded by Carl Sagan. Yeah. And uh, this is on Blu-ray. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna recommend this. This was a good, this is a good doc. It played a bunch of festivals, including uh, AFI Docs and South by Southwest. It's worth checking out. Bill can be surly, but he gets to he science sh- right. Yeah, he, you know what? He's he, he's, he's a, he, the he older sh- he gets, the more surly he gets. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, we also have the final year by uh, Greg Barker, which is about uh, the final year of the Obama presidency, uh, which doesn't turn out the in the end the way that uh, I think all the filmmakers uh, and certainly the people in the film were expecting to. Nonetheless, it makes it more dramatic, and it's uh, very well done. Yeah, a certain Rem- amount of discord in that film between uh, you know, yeah. Samantha and all that kind of yeah. I love that they leave that in the movie. 
I do too. You know, it, in that re- in that degree, it reminded me of uh, uh, D. A. Pennebaker's uh, The War Room yeah. a little bit. Yeah, and it's not it's not on the same level as The War Room. Yeah. They didn't invest as much into it because it's you know The War Room is is about getting there, and this is about leaving there. Yeah. So there's there's less drama in being at the end of the cycle than at the beginning of the cycle. But um, it has a lot of the same honesty and uh, and fly on the wallness, which I thought was cool. Uh, from Indie Picks, a Tom Schiller uh, indie doc, Henry Miller, Asleep and Awake. Um, this was shot when Henry Miller was 81, and uh, it's, you know, Henry Miller has kind of fallen off the radar just a, a, a little bit. And this was made in 2007, and um, boy, what a, what a really fascinating way of resurrecting a, a significant uh, character looking back on on his artifacts and his life and uh, his his philosophy and you know this is a guy who was very much a product of the sexual revolution even even the sexual revolution before the sexual revolution he was kind of the the author of much of the sexual revolution and uh, it's interesting to see what has survived what has dated uh, it's it's a really you know if you're not if you don't know who Henry Miller was or why he mattered uh, first go take a look at Henry and June, the Phil Kaufman movie, yeah. which is just tremendous. Uh, Henry and June is the film that gave us that NC-17. NC-17, that's yep, right. That was Henry. And then look at this. Uh, Victorian rebel Marianne North from the uh, Smith- Smithsonian Channel. Uh, an amazing look. It's just an absolutely uh, wonderful painter, a tremendous artist. Uh, who just completely reinvigorated a particular kind of painting, you know, uh, nature painting and and uh, and botany and and you know, she was to plants what Audubon was to birds is maybe the best way to say it. Uh, really extraordinary documentary about a wonderful, wonderful figure that you should know an awful lot about. A great, a great painter who brought a a very particular female point of view to things too. Uh, more PBS stuff here. Going to go through this little PBS pile as quickly as possible. Um, the, uh, let's see, uh, Survival Guide for Pain-Free Living with Peggy Cappy. It, I'm going to recommend only because Peggy Cappy has done a ton of these sort of exercise and health-related things. And uh, pain in this opioid epidemic has become kind of a, a much more headline thing than, mm. uh, than it was before. So uh, people are drugging themselves too much. And in the wake of people drugging themselves too much, I think it's worthwhile to talk about uh, how, you can, how you can cope with pain uh, in a drug-free way. And mm-hmm. that's what this is. Um, Survival Guide for Pain-Free Living with Peggy Cappy and Lee Albert. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, it's quite a lot of material here. And in, uh, if you have a loved one who's fighting pain, this is really going to be very, very helpful. Um, I, I know some people who've really, really struggled with all kinds of pain. Yeah. And it sucks. When you hurt all the time, you can't. Can't live your life. Tell me about it, baby. Impossible Builds, Volume 1, uh, The Scorpion Tower, Europe in the Desert, and The Floating House. This is uh, uh, just three really, really cool episodes of uh, Impossible Builds, just amazing architectural achievements and and uh, engineering feats. Uh, the Scorpion Tower, which is in Miami, is kind of unbelievably wild and weird. Uh, it's really, really interesting. Uh, Dame Zaha Hadid was the architect there, and it's really, really interesting. Europe in the Desert uh, goes into uh, creating, um, you know, these, like, artificial islands near Dubai that are all ba- kind of European. It's you got to see it. It's just, it's it's hard to, it's this Austrian guy, and he, anyway, the artificial islands thing freaks me mm. out. It's really interesting. And then episode three, Floating House, is also in Dubai. Um, it's this house that floats it's just the weirdest thing you've ever seen anyway really really cool stuff animals with cameras it's the sweetest thing this is an episode of (laughs) this is nature and bbc earth who did this three episodes uh who knew that you could just take a camera you just you strap one of those little like gopro deals onto an animal and (laughs) and uh watch what they do i wish i would have (laughs) known that's all it is man it's great uh next i want to see the uh, people with cameras just strap a gopro onto somebody's (laughs) head and strap it onto my head you will not believe what you see it will Uh... just it will bore you stiff uh you walk in between uh, a tv screen and an office all day long Mm. That's what it is. It's the most boring thing. But you know, when the, the the chimpanzees are the best ones. When they put it, when they put a camera on a chimp, man, that is the sweetest thing in the world. Because <laughs> they can, because they can go high and they can go low. That is VR like nobody's business. You have no idea. Uh, and then uh, Jesus Countdown to Calvary with Hugh Bonneville. This uh, aired just before Easter. 
I highly, highly recommend Love this. Hugh Bonneville. This is so. Here's the thing. When when uh, I first watched this, I thought you know this is basically the story of the last six days of of Jesus's life, and it's revisiting that whole passion thing through the eyes of scholars touring the actual sites in the Holy Land, really kind of trying to put put you know the the the, the history to it, really mm-hmm. going to to it in a, in a very hard way. And um, I thought, oh, Hugh Bonneville. So they went and they, they figured we need, a, we need a, an anchor for this. Let's go get the guy from Downton Abbey to really give it a sense of authenticity. And he'll just talk to some people. No, Hugh Bonneville, before he was an actor, mm-hmm. he was a theology mm-hmm. student. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is where he, he pulls out all of his old textbooks and says, oh, here they are. <laughs> He's got them there in, the, in his backpack. He goes, I haven't seen this beauty in 30 years. You know, I mean, it's like you're like, wow, seriously, dude. You got to love that. You got to love that. He yeah. knows this stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's great. He has these – he's not just some actor who sits down with a scholar and goes, so – Jesus, tell me about Jesus. No, he doesn't. <laughs> he knows it. He like asks them the hard questions, and they come back. He knows how to talk the talk. It's really, really good. That's uh, Jesus Countdown to Calvary. I love it. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Um, Delt is uh, is is okay. This is uh, with uh, this is a film by Luke Corum, and uh, this was at South by Southwest last year as well. And uh, it, basically, a profile of Richard Turner, who's a who's a, a kind of a, a card magician. He's he's a great magician, and uh, he it's going into the whole world of uh, you know card tricks and 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 I doesn't interest me an awful lot. But how people become magicians and how he became an ace magician and and made a go of it, I that's interesting. Uh, I'm always kind of fascinated by people who can make a a career out of being magicians. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, those little weird, odd choices, and there they are actually doing it, you know? Because most of the magicians that I've seen are performing kids' birthday parties, <laughs> and it's not a job. Well, it's like a one or the other thing. You're yeah. either David Blaine floating across uh, the sky uh, yeah. or, or, or Copperfield or, you know, uh, the, the birthday party. Yes, exactly. It's it's just, uh, well, anyway. Um in his own time is a is a really really prescient and uh, and very powerful documentary that's hard to believe it was made in 2015. Wow! Because all I mean it's that's still in our in our moment. I mean the, the issue of police brutality in black communities has been one for for generations, but has really in the wake of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement has really kind of grabbed the headlines again. And um, this is very much a, a 2015 doc that looks at that, that takes a global uh, view of it from all parts of the country, from the south to the north, even into New York. Uh, the behaviors of uh, SWAT teams, you know, that have become over-militarized. And uh, kind of central to this is an incident that took place uh, on the University of Florida campus uh, with a Ghanaian doctoral student, Kofi Adu Brempong. I can't believe I got through that name without <laughs> yeah. destroying it the first time. Uh, and uh, it, it's it's a it's a horrific thing what happened to him. It is absolutely horrific, and uh, that sort of is the launching point, the uh, the central point of of having this discussion. And uh, it's a really really good doc. It's not uh, it's not uh, uh, you know it, it's it's completely uh, scholarly, and it really goes into all the nuances of the issue and. And doesn't come up with any easy answers, which I, I really think is uh, what it needed to do. Uh, Gunrunners uh, was part of the uh, hot doc selection. This is uh, directed by Anjali Nayar. Uh, this is a film movement doc uh, about Kenyan world-class runners. And, uh, you know, everybody's always wondering, why is it, what is it that makes the Kenyans such amazing runners? Now, I always like to joke, <laughs> kind of have our ideas like, well, you know, in Kenya, running is transportation. Yeah. You know, that's how you get from place to place. I got a better joke. Uh, get, what's the better one? They're trying to get the hell out of Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's, it's a lot more than that. Yes. And it yes. is... It is truly amazing. You know, Ethiopia, which is right there adjacent to Kenya, used to produce all the great, all the great runners. Yeah. And um, that particular part of Africa is, is, is home to the greatest distance runners ever. Yeah, but yeah. Now Kenya specifically, men and women. Yeah. And uh, so this specifically focuses on uh, Julius Surreal and Robert uh, Matanda. And uh, it's, it's really interesting 
talking about what led them to become runners mm-hmm. because it's not necessarily just in track. Mm-hmm. It's it's running from things that yeah. are threatening you, whether mm-hmm. it's uh, animals or police or uh, or yeah, a yeah, political yeah, oppression, yeah, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, armed groups and all that kind of. That's, that, that, which is what I meant by my little stupid joke. But, yeah. You know, there you go. And uh, anyway, uh, so this is basically, you know, the uh, this is the all about the, you know, they call it the, the tagline here is a the American dream Kenyan style. But it's it's very much the Kenyan dream. This is how you this is, in fact, like Tim said, how you get out of Kenya. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, you know, every country that has some kind of uh, an issue uh, that people want to escape, there's there's a way of getting out. And uh, it might be making movies. It uh, might be soccer running. Or uh, foot, or soccer. Soccer. Football, soccer, you know, for as they sure. Would, as they would call it. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and it's a perfectly rational thing to do. And, yep. and, 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 in, and in, play, in Ethiopia before and now Kenya, yep. uh, they look around and they see this is the way out of here. For one thing, running uh, only costs the shoes. Yes. Uh, there are now uh, shoe companies. That, that, you know, Adidas is one of them. They, they go up to these places and they give the kids the shoes. Yeah. Uh, and, and then they wait. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, yeah, and oh, it's it's that one. Yep. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah. And then the next thing, and it's it, I think it's great. It's, and it's the kind of sport. It's the kind of sport that I like, in that it really is about individual personal accomplishment. We're gonna yep. all run, and one of us will cross that uh, finish line first. But nobody got hurt. Uh, and I I just love it. Uh, Nicholas uh, Geierhalter, and boy, he spells Nicholas in that real uh, European way, <laughs> N-I-K-O-L-A-U-S, you know, no, no C-H in there. Uh, so uh, Nicholas Geierhalter made a really interesting doc, especially for science people, called CERN, C-E-R-N, which is the, uh, the research, that's the acronym for the research organization known as the European Organization for Nuclear Research, um, and this is all about the Large Hadron Collider, the Super Collider, and you get, uh, I mean, you're talking to a lot of people who uh, work on this thing and run this thing, and it's a lot of high-minded science that goes way above my pay grade. Um, but the idea is that you're recreating the Big Bang inside this contraption, and uh, you kind of need to watch this thing a couple of times to, to really get the, wrap your arms around what these people are talking about, but... Still pretty great. The Large Hadron Collider allowed us to to discover the Higgs boson. Yes. uh, Which is important, and you should look it up. It's why why you're sitting down or standing down. It's why you're not floating away. After the show, you can explain this to me. Because (laughs) honestly, it's just... It's it's, It's why everything. Yeah. Uh, Then we've got, uh, on the lighter side, Designing Dogs from the Smithsonian Channel. Uh, Look, here's the thing. Dogs are one of the most diverse things ever created. There are not nearly, like cows, what are there, like eight or nine breeds yeah. of cows, yeah. maybe yeah. 10. Yeah. Okay, uh, horses. Okay, there are maybe like, I don't know, 15, 20 breeds of horses. You know how many different breeds of dogs there are? Mm. Like hundreds. Mm. It's unbelievable. It's like, it's just, I mean, Yet it's endless. Yet they're still dogs. And, they, and, and it, there's, a, there's a whole way of, of designing dogs, which is what this gets into, which is, you know, that that... that Creating a dog breed and and breeding dogs is a science that just doesn't exist with any other animal, and doesn't always turn out well. It does uh, well as, do- yeah. as dachshunds. <laughs> yeah, that that's an oops. Yeah, you know, my mother grew up with dachshunds that that yeah, yeah. they were they, they're designed to chase badgers into, into holes. holes. But you but you yeah. look at that thing and you just go, I'm yeah. sorry, that's a mistake. Can't that's, be a happy animal. <laughs> yeah, you look at chihuahuas and you go, that's another no, oops. No, that's an oops. That wasn't supposed to happen that way. Mabel, Mabel. Tiger Trainer, um, narrated by Melissa Leo, a film by Lise, Leslie Zemeckis. Uh, I will leave it to you to uh, to figure out if that's any relationship. Um, Ma- Mabel Stark, the Tiger Trainer, uh, who made a splash in circuses in the early part of the of the 20th century, uh, joined the circus in uh, 1911 and became the first woman to train tigers, which she would do for 57 years with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. Uh, you, you think, oh, she's just a, she's like uh, the the two uh, Austrian guys. No. Uh, what are they? The, the, uh, the, 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 oh, the ones that... In um, Vegas. Yeah, with the tigers. Guys, yeah. Yeah. One of them got eaten by a tiger. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, okay. And you, Well, here's the thing. This was not an easy job. She's not just some lady that went out there and went, no. She got attacked by these things over and over. It's an unbelievable life. Wow. Unbelievable life. Really incredible. 
Uh, I'm amazed that this hasn't become a movie. This seems to me like something somebody would jump at immediately. Melissa Leo is a wonderful narrator here, and um, uh, it's pretty great. And uh, by the way, Leslie Zemeckis made a documentary here that was produced by Robert Zemeckis. I wonder if that's mm. well. So anyway, Mabel, Lucky Mabel, kid. Tiger Trainer. It's uh, it's really quite a quite a good film. So Zemeckis talent runs in the family. That's good. Uh, the last two. Art Offline, all one word, A-R-T-O-F-F-L-I-N-E, Art Offline, uh, by Manuel Correa, is, uh, I, I'm not a modern art person, so uh, I, I kind of don't like the, I mean, it, you know, digital art, modern art, the world where the world meets of, uh, of those things, it's a little bit uh, pretentious, however, <laughs> however, at least they don't try to push this in my face and say, this is art. They put it out there and they say, some people think this is crap. Uh, <laughs> like you're probably that. among them, but you make up your own mind. And at the end of it, I was like, yeah, it's crap, but I'm glad you you left it up to my choice. So art <laughs> offline, um, all one word. It's interesting doc for people who want to sort of, who for, you know, if you're a graphic artist, that'll probably be a little bit more interesting. Uh, and then uh, the war show. This played at uh, Toronto. This is also from uh, Film Movement. And uh, this is really, really uh, very, very interesting. This is um, this deals with the the conflict in Syria, which of course uh, is very, very close to me, as I was, you know, working with Syrian refugees last summer. Can't believe it was last summer, almost a year. Uh, that happened quickly. Uh, this all it goes back to March 2011, uh, when a radio figure by the name of uh, Obaida Zaitun. Uh, joined the uh, protests in Syria right at the very, very beginning of when the war was uh, was was kind of spiraling out of control, and it could it didn't have to become a war at that point. Uh, it was sort of part of the the uh, the what they called the Arab Spring at the time. It mm. turned out to be a lot less of a spring than I think uh, people had hoped for. Um, but what transpires after that, and uh, and where that leads, and what happens to him and his friends, that's the subject of this documentary. And it is absolutely devastating. Uh, there have been a lot of great documentaries that have, uh, some of which have gotten uh, nominated for Academy Awards, and uh, they all work together. They're not competing. So I would say, if the if the conflict in Syria is of concern to you, definitely watch this. Add it to your view list. All right, Tim. Uh, what else do we have? You want to do a few of these uh, new, new movies? New movies. Let's do it. Uh, Dive in. You know, some of these folks. Uh, the Post is, uh, has hit. Uh, look, The Post. Uh, Steven Spielberg. Yeah. Um, this was the one movie that in our past Oscar uh, run here yeah. you know, got nominated and all that kind of stuff that yep. I knew Steven Spielberg was unequivocally absent, not not going to win. No. He, the, of all the movies we were thinking <laughs> about, the one I knew wasn't going to win yeah. was this one. Stephen could have stayed at home. Yeah. Um, which is a sort of striking thing to say. Yeah. Particularly since I like this movie, you know, um, uh, I like Meryl in this movie. Yeah. I like that this movie is really about Meryl, yeah. uh, not Meryl, but you know, uh, Catherine, uh, yeah. Catherine Graham. Yeah. Um, and uh, and we were in the middle of that whole sort of Me Too y kind of moment. Uh, and this movie comes along, and this movie, you know, is sort of paying homage to this woman who was a very interesting uh, person who had yeah. to take over that p- paper after her husband yeah. uh, committed suicide. Uh, and I, and I, th- I thought that Meryl, who also got nominated, was was just you know striking in this movie. I like this movie. I know it's not a popular thing to say. Yeah. I like Tom Hanks in this movie. It's really concerned with getting the facts right, you know, yeah. as much as it possibly can. Pentagon Papers are what uh, at, yeah. at stake here. Uh, that's the period. So you know, I like the post, and I think people should see it, uh, particularly as we are having some interesting political moments uh, now. Uh, walking back through the the hi- uh, you know some of these histories, I've been doing a little yeah. bit lately. Uh, diddling around, you know, yeah, because you, 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 yeah, I was, I was wandering, I was reading the paper. Yeah, <laughs> when this was going on, I was reading the paper. Yeah, so, so I understood all this. Anyway, this is this is pretty neat. If you ask me, it has all kinds of new stuff on it. So, uh, check out the post. It's a good movie, a Steven Spielberg film, Den of Thieves, uh, unrated. This was a, a sort of surprising hit. Uh, this little kind of uh, was, movie, wasn't you, it? You movie, kind yeah. of, you know, it was okay. Curtis Jackson, O'Shea, um, O'Shea, uh, 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 Ice Cube's son. Uh, uh, doing pretty good in this movie. Loosely based, loosely, loosely, loosely based on the LA, uh, the LA Sheriff's Department and their sort of crash crew uh, and uh, a bank robbery crew. Um, and, uh, and all of that is so loose it's not really even worth mentioning. Look, it's no heat. Um, and 
yeah, but you know, it's, yeah. it's an it's it's an okay it's an okay little uh, substitute heist. for that. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you, that, if you need that, that itch scratched. Yeah, if yeah. you need that itch scratched. And this unrated uh, one, you know, which is is it, in the theatrical version is also on this. Yeah, so you can check that one out. Insidious, the last key. It does. Is it the last insidious? H- hell no. No. Okay. Uh, but uh, but at the moment, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to pretend like it is. All right. It's it's kind of neat. What it does do is that uh, it takes uh, that doctor, what's her name, uh, back to her little house in Mexico. You know, where mm-hmm. it all started in the sure. first film and all kind of. She didn't, you know. So that's kind of neat. It, it is closing in a circle in a certain kind of way. It's just as creepy as the other ones. If you're into these, you're into these. I don't give a damn about them. But yeah. if you're into them, you're into them. Yeah. Uh, and lots and lots of people are into them. Um, Lynn Shea, uh, who the old lady in the film, I must say, I love me some Lynn Shea. Yeah. Uh, she's fantastic in these movies. Um, digital movie included, uh, blah, 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 blah. Hey, look, uh, this also has some deleted scenes and an alternate ending. Nice. So groovy. All right. We got a humor me with Jermaine Clement and Elliot Gould as, uh, as son and father, respectively. Uh, look, I'm going to recommend just uh, on principle any movie with Jermaine Clement. In yeah. It. Uh, Jermaine Clement could just sit there and stare at a camera for 120 minutes and I would still laugh constantly because Jermaine Clement is just a funny guy. He's the best funny. thing on Legion uh yeah. which just booted up a new yeah. thing cuz it's kind of ah, I have yeah. this, this time out but he's funny. He's great. Yeah. He's just he's just a naturally unbelievably funny guy and it's not he's not Jim Carrey funny. He's not Jerry Lewis funny. Mm-hmm. He's not he's he's deadpan funny. It's just it, it. It's all so understated and just so. You don't have to fall down. He doesn't have to it's fall not down. Chase. He just has to stand there and just kind of look at you and do his weird little twe- tweaky deadpan thing. He's just so unbelievably funny, uh, and he's so good with voices. So basically, he plays a playwright who can't, who's got writer's block and uh, among other many many problems. And so he moves in with his dad in this retirement community. And of course, as these things always happen. Uh, you know, something with that community stirs the creativity within him, and uh, you know things wind <gasps> up turning out okay. Group. It's kind of funny. Yeah, I it's like a. It. It, look, there's a lot of great support. Loosely reminded me of that Guffman movie from Chris Guest's movie yeah. from way back in the day. And a lot of great supporting parts in here. I mean, look, BB Newworth, Annie Potts. Yeah. Uh, it, there are just some really wonderful people in here. Uh, Ingrid Michaelson. Uh, it's a. It's a. It's a really. It's a. It's a fun film. Um, look, Paddington Two. I loved the original Paddington. Yeah. I went on on Film Week and uh, raved about it, and our friend Charles Solomon, who is a purist for the original uh, Paddington uh, books and the artwork of Paddington, uh, just about bonked me on the head because he just thought this whole CGI Paddington thing was was horrific. But the the original was so well done, so clever, so well written, so sweet. Uh, Hugh Bonneville, once mm-hmm. again, mm-hmm. got a lot of Hugh Bonneville. Uh, it's just, I thought it was an absolutely wonderful, wonderful movie. And how do you top Paddington? You know, you top it with Paddington 2, mm-hmm. which is, I'm not going to say it's better, but I'm going to say it's just as good. Mm-hmm. It is just as good. Uh, Paddington, it's, it, the Paddington movies are just ridiculously charming. They're so sweet. Look, in the first one, you had Nicole Kidman uh, being all evil and wicked. Now you have Hugh Grant being all evil and <laughs> wicked. They're they're picking these char- They're picking actors <gasps> that they know really, really want to chew the scenery as a villain and, and go the ne- other way. And yeah. go the other way. And it's so smart. And the 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 whole the whole it's kind of a treasure hunt thing going on here with a treasure map, an interactive treasure map, and it's very clever and it's very sweet. And Paddington, Paddington winds up. I'm not, I'm not going to give anything away. Paddington winds up in jail mm-hmm. at one point. <laughs> And his uh, um, uh, uh, Brendan Gleeson is the grumbly, just horribly incorrigible, mean, incredibly feared chef of the prison. And of course, Paddington and his his sandwiches. Uh, I'll leave the rest to you. It is just so charming, and you can add this to your movies anywhere account. It is a wonderful movie. Looks beautiful on Blu-ray. Uh, Maze Runner: The Death Cure. This is the final uh, in the in that whole little group of Maze Runner uh, yeah. films. Well, you know, I wasn't a big particularly big fan of them, but I got to tell you, they weren't any worse than any of the other ones. You know, there right. were like four or five of those series. Yeah, uh, uh, running around these sort of youth things where you know, apocalyptic this, that, or the other thing, and the children have to save us all. In this particular one, there's a cure that they have to go to the last city. Uh, yeah. The city last. If, which funny about the you know what the last city is called in this in this in this movie? Hmm. The last city. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> Somebody, you know, you know <laughs> that's screenwriting, baby. As we are, as we are recording this, by the way, uh, as soon as we're done with this podcast, I'm I'm heading over to uh, Film Week to uh, ramble about the 15 other movies. I get no, I, I I don't know what I do with my life. I don't. I just stare at screens all day long. Don't forget the French uh, film. Uh, yeah, and then I got Colcoa next week, uh, moderating two events. If you're in LA, come on down, Colcoa yeah. at the DGA. Uh, but uh, one of the films we talked, we were supposed to talk about on Film Week, which I'm going to talk about now for a second, is Genesis, which is this really horrible uh, <laughs> yeah. kind of remake of Ex Machina. Uh, and um, I was telling you before the show, it's like if you're going to do a post-apocalyptic movie, at least a low-budget one, don't show me a post-apocalyptic world in which they have higher tech than we have now, because that makes no sense. It's, but it's all in a cave. It's all in a cave. You're all underground, but we have great tech. Oh, I wouldn't want to leave that cave, man. <laughs> if I had that tech in my home theater, I would never go outside. But the dumb thing there is they have all these little enclaves. It's like, you know, Eden uh. and, uh, and Jericho and all these biblical names for the, for the underground cities, you know. Yeah, yeah, nobody yeah, would yeah. do that. It'd be, you'd, you'd call it Base 1 and yeah, Base 2. Yes, yes. Whatever. And we got to uh, figure out how to get back to the surface. That's nonsense. From Breaking Glass, uh, last seen in Idaho. I love that. I love the taglines here. This is just, <laughs> seeing the future can't save you. Really? Because mm. I would think that it would. I would think that seeing the <laughs> yeah. future could absolutely save you. Duck. Uh, anyway, so this is uh, this is a, sus- a a low budget science fictiony suspense thriller. Um, you know, deal. There, there, memory issues, and uh, you know, this woman uh, named Summer, played by Hallie Shepard, uh, wakens from a coma, and she has, she has complete amnesia. And then uh, there's all this other wacky stuff that falls into line and trying to put your life together, and it all none of it makes any sense. Um, it, the only thing that's interesting here is that it has some decent casting. Uh, one of whom is Casper Van Dien, who I kid you not has not aged in the last 75 years. Yeah, and he's yeah. not even 75 years old. Yeah. Casper Van Dien looked the same before he was born as he looks now. Yeah. I don't know how that works. Yeah, that, well, you know, he always had that chin uh, and that head, and he stays lean, he's, and, he's, and well, he's got that hair. What is he, 60? He's, uh, 60. he's older than me. Uh, so that's close. He looks like he's 35. Yeah, yeah. You know, he and, looks and, the same age he did in Starship Troopers. And, and, and you know, I, I happen to know this because I happen to know this. You know how much he gets for, for knocking those movies out? He how gets, much? He gets a million. Um, it's unbelievable. You know? Yeah, All right. Yeah. And then a nice little trashy uh, slasher movie. These things always work better when they just don't try too hard and when they just let the low budget uh, quality just uh, rip through it. Breaking Glass also gives us Rave Party Massacre. Uh, another great tagline here: "When the beats stop, the horror begins." <laughs> it's set in nineteen. It's, it's set in the early nineties. Yeah, it's so, set in the early nineties. The 90s. music is really kind of really wicked. They 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 kick up the whole nineties uh, rave uh, environment. It's a, yeah. It, it, look, it's all it's all shot in really contained locations, and uh, it's silly and it's just generic slasher stuff. But it's set against a rave party, and it's fun. Yeah, it's kind of. Ben Kingsley uh, and Jackie Bissett uh, are in this movie, uh, Backstabbing for uh, Beginners, which is directed by this uh, Danish director named Pierre Fly. Yeah. Uh, I hate Pierre Fly's movies. <laughs> uh, thus, I hate this one, too. Okay. And, 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 and the thing that I, the thing that really bugs me the most about this movie, it's, um, uh, it's set in the UN, uh, and it has to do with the Iraqi uh, oil reserves in, yeah. in, the, in the UN food program. And it has all these UN workers uh, engaged in the sudden nefarious conspiracy thing when this kid is trying to figure out what's going on and what they're doing is they're 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 doing this of a really dirty food for oil kind of uh, kind of kind of thing where they're getting this oil and, mm. and they're, and they're, and they're, and they're uh, um, uh, not giving the food to the and it's kind of kind of funky and what i didn't like about this movie why is he poking at the u.n <laughs> what, this is a bunch of u.n guys you know but he's and for some reason he's got a heart on for him so i don't like that anyway all right, and then we got strings. You know, there are a lot of these kind of music romances coming out now. Some of them are kind of in that faith-based uh, fringe, and a lot of them are just sort of uh, country music uh, inspired. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know what's really leading this off, other than the fact that apparently a lot of people in the country music world want to be actors. Yeah, uh, it seems to be the uh, the thrust of it, and they can make these movies in. Country you know, music is all the rage, man. They can, they can make movies in anywhere now. They can even make them in Nashville or wherever they are. Um, so anyway, this is about a kind of a, 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 a rock and roll country guy played by Jason Michael Carroll, uh, who, uh, heads for Nashville. 
he leaves the you know his rock and rolly world behind, and he you know goes straight for Nashville. And uh, there, you know, you have the whole the the the, the kind of the formulaic uh, uh, backstage success. What do you what do you trade for success? Yeah, yeah, what do you yeah. giving up for success? And what do you when do you leave success behind to embrace something uh, you know more meaningful in your life? All that kind of stuff. Those those are all, those things are all cliches. But you know what? It's it's well done. For a formulaic film, it's well, well done. Uh, directed by a couple of guys, Robert Wagner and Patrick uh, Dunnigan. And uh, it's a decent cast. It's decently acted. I don't really know any of these people, but the music's good, and it's uh, it's it's heartfelt. Yep, i got to give I it some it. points for that. I liked it. I, like, I liked it. Uh, some, some of the little ones are good. The Chamber. This is one of those uh, little movies that have figured out a way to set itself in one place uh, uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, and, and make it and get made for 18 bucks. I'm not going to be angry about that. You know, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of a smart thing. And if you come up with a fairly intense thriller, uh, you can get there. Ryan uh, Ryan Reynolds did the one where he was in the car. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and the, uh, this one, so this one is set um, uh, in a submersible, uh, ostensibly off the coast, uh, uh, in, uh, under the Yellow Sea, off the coast yeah. of Korea. And uh, they're on a special ops mission. Something goes wrong. They're submerged. Uh, how will they survive? Uh, can they get back to the top? Air is running out. Submersible is filling up. You can get some fairly intense stuff out of that. Uh, uh, and uh, they, they, they managed to actually do it. So uh, The Chamber, check it out. So we got some classic movies now. Uh, Going to kick through a few of these. Um, let me start with the the Arrow stuff. We've got some really really intense stuff from Arrow. Um, this is there are no Arrow uh, academies in here. These are all straight up Arrow video, which means this is all you know kind of genre stuff and uh, and really good ones too. Um, do not confuse the George Romero film Season of the Witch with the Halloween yeah, season, season of the, of the Witch. Halloween yeah. 3 yeah. Season of the Witch. Don't confuse those. Halloween 3 is the Halloween film that has nothing to do with Michael Myers yeah. or, or the Halloween franchise. It's also called Season of the Witch. Uh, this Season of the Witch is a George Romero film from 1972. And uh, it's really kind of his attempt to do something other than a zombie movie, other than a Night of the Living Dead thing. Uh, and for the most part, it works. Um, it was uh, originally called Jack's Wife, and at one point it was titled Hungry Wives, and they tried to, you know, do that uh, uh, several different times. Um, it's it's a supernatural, obviously witch-oriented story, but it's quite interesting. It's very effective in terms of its style, as, you know, early Romero often is from the 60s, 50, all the way from, you know, Night of the Living Dead right into the 70s. Yeah. And uh, lots and lots of really interesting extras in here, including... Guillermo del Toro talking to George Romero, which is great. And there's even an uh, audio commentary by Travis Crawford. You know, we lost George, what, uh, not uh, a couple of months ago. Yeah, yeah, j- just yeah. just months so ago. That's really, yeah. So uh, anyway, and then there's also an audio commentary to a location gallery that they go through with the Romero historian. Uh, a lot of really interesting stuff. If you're a Romero person, you'll really, really dig this. Uh, and then The Crazies is another Romero film that I am less fond of it came the following year uh this really people love the that i know who love romero they really love the crazies it's a biological uh I, I love the crazies. do you love the yeah, crazies I see the people who love the crazies love the crazies <laughs> um it, it's i don't know it's a little it's a little over the top for me but uh look tim loves the crazies <laughs> Uh, so who am I? It's just it's it's too gory for me to be honest. That's I, the thing. That was when I was a gory hard. That's eighty what. Seventy three. Seventy three. Yeah. I, I, I would have thought it was about eighty or something. Yeah. I, you know, I, I saw that movie in the drive in, man. It's and it's it and it it basically, you know, uh, Night of the Living Dead. Let's sort of let's sort of uh, do all this. R- Romero does here with the crazies is he reinvents the the zombie genre yeah. in the way that it is is more today. Like everything that we have today from. You know, 28 Days Later to uh, World War Z, all of that. Our zombies today are not people who died and then came up out of the ground and walked slowly towards you no. so that they could gnaw on your fingers. Yeah. Our zombies today uh, are living people who are infected by some Zombie. kind of a biological virus that turns them into rampaging, fiercely running speed demon people yeah. who will eat your head in about three seconds flat. Yeah. That's what we have today. And uh, that doesn't descend from Night of the Living Dead. That, that descends from, from the crazies. The crazies. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So it's a landmark film, but it's you know I don't <laughs> I, I just don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy it at all. Um, mm. A couple of films on a double feature here: uh, spaghetti western stuff, basically. Duccio Tassari, 
uh, made the films A Pistol for Ringo and The Return of Ringo. And uh, it's, it, you know, it's not kind of classic uh, spaghetti western necessarily, um, but they're, they're, they're memorable in their own way. Uh, Tassari is not my favorite filmmaker, but I get it. The, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a vibe here, you know, that is very much its own. And uh, you can't, you know, forego the fact that they have amazing Ennio Morricone scores. And as these films often do. And, uh, you know, the, if, you, if you're a fan of the genre, this is certainly a corner of it that mm -hmm. is not often sufficiently explored. Tons of extras. A really very gr good Blu-ray transfer for both. Really, really impressive. And that's not often the case for Italian movies um, of any kind. So they really, uh, they did really a, a great job here. And tons and tons of extras where they go, and, you know, they're talking to, to film critics and, and revisiting just about everything to do with these movies. Really good. And then the last one from Arrow... A personal favorite of mine, just because I was of a, a very impressionable age when this came out. Um, everyone hates clowns. I don't know anyone who likes clowns. <laughs> clowns are creepy. And you know what? Never creepier than in Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Yeah. Now, Killer Clowns from Outer Space is exactly what it's about. Yeah. It's about a spaceship that lands yeah. with these horrible, murderous aliens who look like clowns. Yeah, with teeth. And, and that's, you know, that's the movie. Doing what clowns actually do, by the way. That's the movie. Which is try to kill you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the guys who made this are the uh, Kyoto brothers. They haven't really done anything else. They've worked on other movies uh, as effects guys. Yeah. Like, you know, I think they did some work on they, they, the Critters. They did the Critters movies before this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they continue to do that kind of stuff. But, uh, boy, what a great cult classic. Killer Clowns from Outer Space is stone cold hysterical. And you sometimes feel guilty for laughing at the stuff that's in it. Tons of extras here. You are not going to believe the extras. Uh, they went overboard. They went like Criterion crazy for these extras. <laughs> they did. It's unbelievable. Um, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Interviews and featurettes. There's a new documentary uh, on their childhood films from the Coyote Brothers. Uh, you know, all of their, all of their early little movies. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you see their, their whole sensibilities evolving. It's really interesting. And there's even an interview with the, uh, the composer, uh, which I thought was interesting because it is kind of a very, uh, very 80s score. So, uh, tons of great stuff here. This is a wonderful special edition. Killer Clowns from Outer Space from Arrow. Uh, Want to knock off? Uh, yeah, let's hit those two and then we'll uh, call it quits. Call it quits. Uh, Cyborg, Jean-Claude Van Damme. That would be yeah. good. Um, there, was, uh, there was Bloodsport and then I think Black Eagle. And then Cyborg. And Cyborg was the one that, that I decided I was a Jean Claude. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I was like, you know what? I'm down with this. Yeah. Uh, and, it's, and, you know, it's kind of a neat movie. It's a futuristic sort of thing. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is woman in that suit. She's like yep. half android or whatever. And she's running the world. And they got to get to it. So this is a neat sort of uh, beginning of something, too, I think, uh, yep. with this movie. That the whole sort of uh, combination of martial arts and futuristic, this yep. and the other thing. And then Dr. Detroit. The, yes. the interesting thing about Dr. Detroit is it is a movie that could not be made today. A movie about a college professor that becomes a pimp. <laughs> <laughs> and has a bunch of hoes, yeah. <laughs> and and it's funny and it's charming, and people forget Lynn Whitfield uh, was yeah. one of them hoes. Yeah, uh, Fran Drescher <laughs> was one of them hoes. <laughs> <laughs> Donna Dixon, his oh. wife at the time, yeah. one of them hoes. Yeah, uh, and 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 you do. I, I don't know. You just T.K. Carter's in this yeah. movie. I mean, this movie. I love this movie, but I know in my bones she can't even pitch no. this movie. No, today. you couldn't. It's 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 just yeah, it's vintage Dan Aykroyd, yeah. and uh, and I love the theme song by the way. Uh, if you love Devo, you're going to love the theme song. It's just, it's great. That's a, well, it's from Shout Select. Good for them. Good on them for <laughs> pulling Dr. Dr. Detroit. Detroit. It's fantastic. All right. We're done for this week. Uh, monitor the news for Netflix. They'll drop another bomb on us at any given moment. It's happening weekly. We'll see you next week.